The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or wherever wherever you are in the world, it might be good afternoon, or it might even be good evening. My name's Rodney Holder from musicbusinessfacts.com, and I would like to thank you for uh, listening in. I've also got a uh, live audience on Facebook today, so g'day you guys as well. And uh, my guest today is a good friend of mine, Mr. Tim Price from Collision Course Publicity. How are you feeling this morning, Tim? I'm great, mate. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you for having me. Yeah, look, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy day. I know being a small business owner in the music industry is absolutely crazy and you are always freaking busy. So I really do appreciate your time, Tim. And uh, uh, It's my pleasure, man. Yeah, mate. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing you share your absolute wealth of knowledge. Just before I get started, I just want to uh, say good day to a few people. We've got quite a few people on the uh, webinar today. We've got uh, Daniel O'Brien. G'day, Daniel. G'day, Gabby. G'day, Haley. There's two Haley's, in fact. G'day, Hayden. G'day, Josh. G'day, Katie. Katie's back. She, she's a sucker for punishment. Katie, you are, I tell you. Uh, I think it's Keelan and Lemonade. That's a great name. And Nat and Reese and Richard and Roman and Rosemary. G'day, Rosemary. And g'day, Sean, Simon, uh, Tanja and Vanessa. So thanks for coming, guys. I just want to make sure that you can absolutely hear us both and you can see the screen. If you can give me a little high five. And Haley, look at that straight away, giving me the flashing high fives. Fantastic with the little hands. Excellent. All righty. So I'm just going to fire up this screen here and hopefully you're going to work for me. There we go. And just give you a little bit of a background. Like I said, uh, Tim has been a good mate with, of mine now for a long time and I've always been really, really impressed with his press releases. So uh, that's where the title of this came from, how to write incredible press releases that will help you get attract media attention. Because I think um, I look at my press releases that I've sent out with my own little sort of strategies that I have for it. And I looked at yours, Tim, and I used to think, geez, these are way better. I've got to fix mine up. But of course, Tim's going to talk a lot more about just press releases today as well. He's going to talk about um, his publicity and uh, his publicity company and, and a whole heap of stuff. So just quickly, Tim, before we start the lecture, do you want to just uh, give everyone a little bit of a background of how you uh, actually got into publicity and became a publicist? Because I know a lot of my students, they want to get into that kind of thing as well. I want to give them a little bit of your backstory just quickly. Sure. Um, I, I guess... My my story with publicity really started when, and, and I guess maybe a bunch of people maybe started the same way, uh, when I was playing in a band myself and realised that it was a critical sort of link in the chain um, in releasing music and, and making announcements to the world. Um, you know, playing in a band and, and trying to get news out there into the world, um, you know, maybe just to your uh, little sector of the world, your, your fan base and your, um, and your audience can sometimes feel like a bit of an echo chamber. Um, and, and I thought to myself that, you know, why aren't people paying attention? And it's because honestly, the, unless it's being, you know, fed pretty directly to them, a lot of industry and a lot of media and whatever are not, they're not going out and just trolling through everyone's Facebook page, looking for new content and going, Oh, cool. I'll post that on, you know, I mean, sometimes that happens, but you know, it's rare. And so I thought to myself, well, how do I do this? And I started building myself a, an email database of people interested in music, like uh, the band that I was playing in and also the band that I was managing at the time. And, uh, and I quickly amassed a fairly decent list and and started to get my relationships going with those people. And uh, eventually, you know, I was able to go, you know what, uh, I can I can build a business out of this. And I started slowly. I didn't I didn't uh, immediately start um, charging, you know, huge fees to do what I was doing. But uh, I started with some bands that I really, really believed in and, and uh, believed that there could be a, a real future for them. And, and uh, those two bands, uh, you know, were Guards of May and Forever the Optimist at the time. And, uh, you know, forged some really great relationships with those bands and, and uh, really took them as far as I possibly could, um, you know, on, on limited budget and, you know, with basically just their great music. 
That's a great story, mate. I'm, I'm sorry about the pause there. I've just had a couple of people saying that the slides have disappeared. So I'm just going to go back yeah, to no, body. Did they disappear for you as well? Yeah. They have, huh? Uh, let me see here. What's going on here? Uh, there it is. They're back? Slides yep. are back, Tim? Yep. Uh, audience, Ben, Daniel, Gabby, Hayden, Haley, can you see the slides? Quick little high fives. Uh, hmm. Nat Rose saying yes. This is the joys of doing live webinars. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, that's all good now then. Now, Tim, just to what you were saying, um, thanks for sharing that story first up. Um, the thing I love about that is that, again, you're uh, one of my guests who, again, say you're a self-starter. So this is really inspiring, I think, yeah. for anybody that wants to break into the business, really in any capacity. And it's one of the things that I love about the music industry is that it absolutely is a can-do industry. Like, if you want to be a songwriter, you can just start writing songs. If you want to play in a band and you really want to do that, well, put a band together and start doing that. And if you want to be a publicist, uh, again, Tim, like you did, you probably were the guy doing the publicity for your band anyway, playing that management role. And then the other important thing I think you said was the, uh, the importance of building that email database, which is very, very important in any business, particularly an online business where you are doing most of your work. So again, people, there's some pretty awesome gold nuggets there that if you weren't aware of straight away to, uh, to take that on board. Sure thing. So let's get going, Tim. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just uh, sit back and you just tell me what you uh, want me to do. And if you don't mind, I'll jump in and out as I do. But you're the, you're the uh, expert here and you're the guy who I've invited on. So you're talking about the essentials, about being a publicist. Uh, mate, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Okay, so I've, I've written these as these are the kind of, these are the goalposts of where we're going to be going uh, through, the, through the chat. Um, as you can see there... I actually don't get to writing and designing the press release until number seven because frank frankly the 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 main part of it is actually putting it together the strategy and getting everything together before you actually design the press release the press release is important but more important is timing and strategy and actually having all of your ducks in a row so uh let's let's get stuck into the reasons why you'd actually decide to do it yourself or hire a publicist. So next slide, please. Yeah, so that's it, is it? You don't, I, I was just thinking, God, there's so much stuff there, Tim. Like, for instance, you said the strategy. Can you can you give us what the strategy is, what you mean by that? Like some examples? Because for some people, we get the concept of what you're saying by, by strategy. But I'm, what I want to try and extract from you is, you know, on a, on a micro level, what do you mean by strategy? Like, so let's say we're a band and we're trying to get attention. Okay. So the first thing, I guess, to know is that media generally don't want to cover things that are out already. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for publicity on a song that you already have that is publicly available either on YouTube, on Facebook, on Spotify, on iTunes, anywhere else, generally that's too late. So the strategy there is that you actually need to be working backwards from your release date um, the appropriate amount of time. So depending on what you're actually releasing, whether it's an album, EP, single, video clip, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's about working back from that and allowing yourself enough time for those things to to hit, uh, for, the, for media to get connected with it, um, to be able to announce it. And, you know, perhaps if you're going for premieres, to make sure that those people are the only people at that moment to be posting that content and giving them the, you know, the audience that, that you're going to give it on that day. Um, so for things to be most effective, you actually need to be strategic in the way that you um, are planning your release. So it's, it can't just be, uh, you know, Hey, we want to premiere this song tomorrow. <laughs> it's, because Do people really nine times out of ten, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I have people coming to me post album release asking me because the album release didn't go necessarily that well, mm -hmm. coming to me and saying, "Hey, we need help pushing this." And unfortunately, in those cases, it's the the answer is, "I can't." It's it's done. Yeah, the the, the album release cycle is done. No one will write a review on this now um, because it's out. And 
So, Tim, is it a case of you need that exclusivity to be able to to put the strategy together in place? And then, of course, you need the time to be able to put it in place uh, with the right amount of, uh, yeah. you know, um, thing, like you said, the ducks in a row kind of thing. Correct, yeah. You know, it, it, it it's it's acknowledging that, you know, when when you send a record to a media outlet, whether that's press or online, they need to find a writer who's interested in doing a review of that uh, record. It's giving them time to listen to it and take it in, form a critical opinion on it, then write their opinion on it, maybe draft it a few times, and then and then be able to post it. You know, so you're looking at weeks there yep. potentially. So it may may take two weeks before the editor gets to it and then another week till a writer picks it up and is keen to do it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's acknowledging that you need to allow that time before anyone may even be interested in looking at your music. And same same goes with radio. So, you know, it's acknowledging that unless it's an absolute slam dunk and you know that that radio station is going to pick that up and even then who really knows if it's going to, if a song is going to get up, mm -hmm. it's, it's acknowledging that this, it might take weeks. It might take weeks before it even gets listened to. So, so, so ideally, Tim, you know, your, sorry to cut you off, but ideally in your opinion, how many weeks in advance should someone be speaking to you before they're trying to do any of this stuff? Basically, the, the big mistake that I see bands making is before they are even finished recording the record, um, going out to their fan base and setting a release date. Mm -hmm. And then and then potentially going overtime in the studio and then mixing and mastering gets delayed and then leaving themselves two weeks before their record's out. Mm. And, that's, and that's a problem. The best thing that you can do in that situation is actually finish the record, get or the single or the EP, whatever it is, stop and then make your plan. Right. Get the mix and master, you know, get all your ducks in a row and then look at publicity and work with your publicist around the strategy around release. No, excellent. Or if you're doing it yourself, wait until you, because the, the biggest enemy you're working against there is the fact that you're eager to get this record out. You're eager to get the single out. You, you want people to hear it. Yep. And that's fine. That's a great thing to do because you know that, like, I guess in that, it assumes that there's an audience there waiting for it. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's going to be way more effective and way more uh, widespread if you have the support of media outlets posting about it uh, you have, you know, radio premiering it when you want it to be premiered. And that's all about giving it to them in good time with the ability to plan around the, like the potentially the radio show um, or, you know, if you want to premiere a, a song online, a video online, it's making sure that you actually give it to them a week in advance and go, hey, do you actually have next Thursday available to premiere this? Because nine times out of ten, the answer is no, we're full that day. So you actually need to have a little bit of flexibility about it. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, look, this is great, Tim. And uh, really, uh, you're the uh, the second publicist I've spoken to in two days. I spoke to uh, Angela Mastro Giacomo from Muddy Poor in the US yesterday, who I just saw as joined me on uh, Facebook Live. So hi, shout outs to Angela. She's um, <clears throat> hey, hey. watching. But, um, and I have to introduce you to you guys as well. But uh, she said exactly the same thing, you know, that everything you're saying is is pretty much being mirrored what Angela said, which is, again, for you listeners and you viewers of this, this is really, really important stuff. You know, these guys are the professionals and these are the big mistakes that, uh, you know, many of your own peers are doing or, you know, young managers are doing. So uh, please take, ho pay, take heed and listen. Um, I also wanted to hit you up, Tim, about uh, you've got up there the target audience and know the target audience. Are you're talking about the media or are you talking about the fans? Yeah. No, the, the media. So, you know, it, it, that's about uh, kind of building, uh, that's about building your list and about making sure that you're, that you're not, you know, targeting outlets that you're not going to get any love from despite it, no matter how many times you ask. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, basically if you're a, if you're a melodic death metal band 
and you're wanting coverage on pile rats, just forget it because, you know, they have a very specific type of music that they cover and it's just not going to connect no matter how many times you ask Mm -hmm. and getting shitty at them about that, about them not supporting you or not posting your, your music is not helpful. Um, So it's about knowing and, you know, you're better off getting a hundred percent of 15 contacts rather than 1% of, you know, 200 contacts, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gotcha. It's, My math is probably horrible there, but do you know what I mean? <laughs> That's all good. I think we know what you mean. Just yeah. before we move on with the lecture, Tim, uh, I'm just wanted to ask you some uh, networking strategies because obviously, you know, you, you seem to know everybody in the industry, especially especially here in Australia. And I know that you go to things like Big Sound, you go to the conferences, you're always uh, meeting and greeting with people. But can you give anyone listening to this some strategies about building networks, especially if you're starting from a, like a, a cold call stance, like you don't know about anyone in that particular media outlet? What do you do? Do you just ring them up and say, G'day, my name's Rodney and uh, I'm a publicist and I want to uh, send you stuff or how does it work? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of that. Um, I mean, once you're rolling, you generally get the, you know, if, if an editor changes or something like that, you generally, because you've provided lots of content, you know, you generally get the email going, hey, that's going to change. Um, you know, please change your mailing list to this going forward or whatever. But if, you, if you're just getting started and you're... Um, and you, you're creating your list from scratch. The most things to remember is that every website has a contact section and it, it's somewhere there on the website. Uh, you just got to go and find it. And, um, you know, the, it's about, you know, either the grabbing the phone number or grabbing the email address and, and sending before you add them to your list. It's about setting them a courtesy call or email first and saying, Hey, how you doing? This is what I do. Do you mind if I add you to my list? I mean, granted, you can't be doing that all day long, every day. Um, so there will be some that, you know, you'll probably just add because you go, okay, they're, they're my bread and butter. I'm going to have to contact those people regardless. But there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of credence in in, in uh, introducing yourself first and saying this is actually what we do because if the person's not into it then they will they'll say hey thanks for getting in touch that's actually not kind of what we do and so you actually get a chance to go cool there's someone to not have in my list but they're a nice person so I'll keep in contact with them so you either keep the you know keep emailing them or you you know when you actually you know meet them in something like big sound you can you can actually say good day, and that's you know that's a you know I, going to Big Sound and going to all of these you know all of those networking things uh, has has just been gold. Most of the people I chat to at those conferences are the people that I don't necessarily uh, have have ever worked with, um, you know. But they're just good people that we chat and we share music with, and you know. They know that I do heavy music, and I know that they do hip hop or whatever it is that they do, and we can we can chat about our mutual things, and there's a mutual respect there of, hey, looks like things are going well for you, you know. Mm-hmm. Great, great. So you just never know who you're going to end up working with. So it's just, you, it's way better to just be friends with everyone, and you know, regard, you know, it's no good, uh, no good just writing someone off because they don't necessarily do work in your genre. Yeah, yeah. And I guess a lot of this comes back to just being a good dude or a good dude, right? And uh, having good personal skills 100%. and yeah, being being ethical and having high integrity and all that kind of thing, which is to me quite obvious, but to some people it doesn't seem to hit home how important it is. Um, yeah. Tim, when I get an email from you with one of your awesome press releases, which again, I'm very always very impressed with, how are you sending them mm-hmm. out? Are you using like a, a MailChimp or an AWeber or just Outlook? Can you give us a bit of an insider trader trick there or tip? Yeah, I mean, over the last two years, um, and I, I've so Collision Course has been going for four years. Um, the first two years of my business, I used Mailchimp, mm-hmm. and it was it, it's excellent and it's very simple to use and it's very powerful and effective, um, and especially on being able to segment your lists about along, you know, genre lines or. Um, 
uh, or location wise. Mm-hmm. And it's free um, for the first 1500, isn't it? Yeah, depending on how large your list is, it's yeah. free. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then when I moved into the office and I and I merged my business with SGC Media, um, I adopted their um, their program, which was. Oh, I can't remember the first one. We've been through three uh, in my two years that I've been there. Sure. Um, but we've come, we've come all the way back to Mailchimp. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, and but Mailchimp uh, with a plugin called Nimble, and Nimble is its own uh, program. Uh, it's about customer or client relationship management, mm-hmm. um, and it doesn't necessarily do the the mail outs, but it manages your lists for you. Uh, and and pulls in all of their um, social media contact and all of that sort of stuff as well. So you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of information about that person to be able to connect with them personally. Mm. Um, and and then basically you export your list from there out to Mailchimp and then do your your mail send out. But basically we we're using Mailchimp at the moment purely for the actual design element of it and the, like the ease of putting together the pro- the press release and the template and all of that sort of stuff. Right. And it, it's, it's really, it's, it's been the best um, system we've had for sure. Mm. So, so again, when I get one of your press releases, it's got like, you know, the built in SoundCloud uh, play button and uh, yeah. all that, all the photos and images you're building all that in, in MailChimp. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, graphic design knowledge that I need to have there. I mean, I have to, you know, create, you know, with, with SoundCloud, um, you know, you, you can't just embed a SoundCloud. That's actually just an image uh, with a link embedded. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually have to go and, you know, screen capture that and then, you know, resize it in Photoshop and, you know, crop it down so it looks like an embedded player and all of that sort of stuff. So, I mean, there's a few smoke and mirror tricks there, but um, it's it's more to do with that it looks nice and it looks easy to access. Yep. Um, like, Ease of access is really the, the the big point about what I do. I want it very clear. Here is the download for the track. Here's the stream. Here's what uh, where you can pre-order the album. You know, I, I want outlets to be able to grab it and be on the go from first click. Yeah, they can play it uh, on their radio show with one click. Mm-hmm. They can download it, or they can they can embed that um, you know that stream with one click. So it, it's it's really about minimising the amount of work for the media outlet to be able to put that on their website, or play that song, or review the album. So it's it 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 really you know is about simplifying the message to them about sure. what is what I'm asking them to do. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, we better move along. And thanks for that, Tim. Uh, Hayden Foley just asked quickly, "What is Mailchimp?" Yeah, Hayden, it's simply like a uh, a service that you can sign up to. I think it's free for the first fifteen hundred uh, mail email addresses, where you can you can speak to people personally and speak to people, uh, you know, with one press and and send it out. And like Tim said, segment your audiences. So if you had different types of bands that you're representing or different styles of media, etc. So yeah, I checked that out. Um, Tim Richard Stevens wants to know if a single is out. But the music video is still yet to be released. Is it too late for doing a review of the video only? Uh, well, generally, there's a lot of media at the moment that just don't do single reviews and all of that sort of stuff. But it's not too late to put a press release out about the video. Um, generally, what I'll do with a, a video clip is that I'll actually go and get a premiere for the video clip. Um, and if there's it's more effective if there's another piece of information along with that mm-hmm. so it could be band releases video clip and announces tour dates mm-hmm. that's that's a really effective press release um or band and uh, band drops video clip and announces uh, album pre-orders go on sale something like that um the, those are you know it's it's best with more than one piece of information in that regard if it's not the first time that the that the music is being heard, then if it's the video, I mean, you can just go with a band drops video clip, but you you're really only going to get a burst of one or two days worth of news out of that. 
Right, okay. Interesting, interesting. Tim, what about physical copies? Is it? Do you st- are you still sending out physical copies to any of these media outlets? Interesting that you bring that up because I had this discussion yesterday. Um, it's it's really becoming less and less, um, and it uh, it kind of comes down to the band or the label's preference. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm happy to do it if I get them, but it's becoming way more rare that I'm getting uh, CDs sent to me to send out. Mm-hmm. Um, Probably one because bands are probably printing less CDs, um, and therefore their overheads to break even on the sales of those include the number of copies that you would usually send out on promo. Um, you know, uh, you probably need the two hundred and seventy out of three hundred to break even, or you know, or whatever. Yep. Um, but um, the other thing to note as well is outlets like Triple J. I mean, not that that's effective for everyone, but outlets like Triple J are actually requesting that bands and publicists don't send CDs anymore because most of them end up in the bin and they don't want to be environmentally, you know, reckless. Yeah, okay. That's that's a good point. Uh, Triple J for uh, the international viewers and listeners is Australia's largest youth uh, national network. Uh, it's pretty much where a lot of contemporary music, they face their uh, marketing promo on towards because if you get played on Triple J, you get played across Australia. Um, and then just on that other point, you know, I speak to uh, more old school guys and I say that respectively, but like, you know, um, like guys like Andy Farrow who manage Opeth and that he says he prefers the CD because he likes to listen to it in his car when he's driving around to, to give it a good listen, you know? So, yeah, I, look, it's definitely personal preference. And the reason I had that conversation yesterday was actually with a media outlet who said, I don't do reviews unless I get the CD. Yeah. And I said, yeah. and you know, I said respectfully, that's, like that's awesome and I get it. You you really should get something for what you're doing because let's face it, you are putting this, you know, you're putting reviews up for free. Um, but I said, unfortunately, just going forward, I, I don't get a lot of CDs to send out. So I'll send you them when they are there, but I, I, I feel like there's going to be less and less coming your way, not just from me, from, from everywhere. Hmm. An old school tip I read about a long time ago, and I don't know whether this is still relevant, you might have an insight to this, but that if you were going to send out any physical uh, copies, knowing that they probably will end up in the bin, is if you uh, include a, uh, a self-stamped addressed envelope to send it back. <laughs> so it might cost you another $2, but it, I guess it might be a, I don't know, might be pointless. But what do you think about that self-stamped uh, address envelope so that if you don't like the CD, please send it back? Um, Look, I've ne- I've never not seen that approach. I don't I don't know how effective that is. I couldn't I couldn't really comment. So you're too young, Tim. That's the old school way to do it, mate. You can try and get asked for them back, and they used to come back when we used to send out CDs back in the nineties. Some people would uh, send them back to us. Um, there you go. All right, uh, Hayden wants to know, Tim, you personally, what do you prefer if you're uh, going to be working with an act? Do you prefer uh, just an online copy, or do you like the CD version? Uh, personally, I. I really prefer a, a digital copy because I really need to be able to listen to it on the go uh, and very quickly. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, in my day, I'm, I'm listening to hundreds of songs. Of course. Um, so, and, you know, I've, I've got to wrap my mind around an entire album, you know, and I've, you know, I'm taking on, you know, five or six new clients a month. I've got to be around those. I've got to be on top of everything. So, you know, preferably a Dropbox link if you're going to send me, you know, WAV files or MP3s. Um, even a stream is is great uh, because I need to be able to listen to it straight away mm-hmm. to take it in and go, yes, no, I like this. Um, so it and you know, so being across, being able to ha- able to send private streaming links or private Dropbox links and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, it's becoming a new, you know, sort of requirement of, of, uh, you know, being in a band and knowing how to privately send stuff to people without, you know, uh, without revealing it to the world. Yep. Sure. And Tim, I'm curious about this. I always tell my clients always come out with your best song first, your best absolute song, because because of that fact that you are listening to such a ton of music that you've really got to get anybody's attention straight away. So I always suggest you come out with the best one you got. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, I agree with that. 
However, sometimes when there's so if you're asking the opinion of the person, then, you know, maybe you will send a couple and go, if we're going to lead out with our single, what's the, which of these would you suggest? Um, obviously you're going to have to send a couple. Um, but that's the whole point is you're actually, uh, you're actually collaborating with, you know, a potential partner to get their opinion on what is the best one to put forward. And I mean this with absolutely no disrespect to bands, but sometimes what bands think is their best foot forward is not necessarily correct for media or for radio or for um, for their career at that moment. Yep. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the most radio-friendly song on there because often, I mean, especially in our genre, in the heavy genre, um, you know, leading out with your ballad or your, you know, your softer track or whatever, thinking that that's going to be the thing that gets you on radio is just kind of dead wrong at this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, I mean, uh, that I can't really comment for overseas, but certainly for Australia, if you want a career as a heavy artist, leading out with your softer song first, just to try and get some radio is actually just going to cop you with, you know, oh, they've sold out or they've gone soft or whatever. Um, it, it's it's actually better to lead out with your heaviest thing and be known as a heavy band and and go deep on that, um, and you know, and be uh, be known for what you are and, and stand up proud for it. Sure. Um, because you know, in, in a situation where you've got uh, Triple J, you know, has a, a wealth of things that they can play if they're going to play a heavy band they're going to play a heavy band Mm -hmm. they're not going to go oh great let's let's get the uh let's grab their softer song because otherwise they just they'd rather play you know indie music if they're going to play a soft rock song they're going to play an indie band so you know it's better that you go deep on you know the most kick-ass rock heavy metal you know, whatever it is that you do, lead out with that. Yeah, yeah. And go and go deep. Re- represent what your music generally is going to represent. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Yep, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no good leading out with, a, you know, a softer song and then trying to lead out a month later with something that's heavy as hell and people going, what is this band? They're very... Very schizophrenic. <laughs> hey, uh, Tim, Hayden's got a really good question. He says, does the artwork of the album help any, help uh, grab attention anymore or is it irrelevant because it's digital? If someone sends great music but terrible artwork, does that diminish the attraction? Uh, the good thing about being a publicist at that point is if, if your ducks are in a row and you're actually getting in touch about putting out a single or a record or whatever and you're sending it to me with terrible artwork, if we've got time up our sleeve, the great thing is I can go, look, the song is awesome, but this artwork is horrible. Can we, can we go somewhere else? Can we get another draft? Is there something that can be done? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, I, I have come up against that um, where I've just gone, oh, guys, what, what's going on here? Um, this is just not matching up. Um, what, what can we do? And uh, it's, it's a case of, if you're organized that that can that can happen um but if it's in a rush it's like okay i guess we're leading out with this and yeah it can hurt Mm. um because you know if you're leading out with that before anyone clicks anything they see it they see the artwork so you know same goes for promo photos as well make sure your promo photos are great because you know the the shot after your show last week you know sweating backstage at the at the venue that's not going to work mm, mm. Um, Hayden in my personal opinion I think everything has to be brilliant it's the music industry is so competitive the production has to be amazing the songs have to be amazing the recording has to be amazing the artwork the photos the bio the press kit the press releases everything has to be amazing the more things you have that is yeah. a strength the more chance that you have of getting people's attention and then you know getting that getting that traction that everyone's looking for because it's so brutally competitive that's my personal opinion yeah, agreed. I mean, things are subjective, uh, as in, 
you know, one person's art is another person's trash. Sure. But, you know, there's, there's general standards of quality about artwork and mastering and all of that sort of stuff that I think probably need to be adhered to on that, on that level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lemonade's come up with a great question, Tim. What about uh, gimmicks to get noticed, giving gifts and uh, uh, what else is he said here? Just, you know, gimmicks in general. I mean, there's some great examples of of, of large acts doing, you know, uh, stunts and things like that to get noticed. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that if a band comes up with ideas like this? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it, it can work. I think if you don't necessarily have the budget to maintain it long term or, uh, you know, or, or follow through on the full extent of a gimmick, then I think you you're really going to struggle up against, you know, like stuff like major label content um, where they may have, you know, like things like uh, what I thought worked really well uh, recently was North Lane's um, uh, message bot on their Facebook um, that sort of let out cryptic clues and you could have a conversation with them. And, and I mean, I guess everyone knew there was a North Lane album coming, but uh you know, then to then drop it immediately on that Friday morning, just drop the entire album without an announcement or anything like that. You know, that was, I mean, it, it, it earned them a number three on the ARIA chart. I mean, I'm guessing, you know, they and the label were probably shooting for a number one, but number three is definitely nothing to, to sneeze at. And I think, you know, all that, sto- that sort of stuff really um, got... Got thing, got people talking and thinking about how to to do a gimmick like that um, effectively. And while that while that seems like that doesn't require budget, so um, you know the message bot set up and whatever isn't as far as I know it doesn't cost anything. But it's the planning and strategy around the questions and the graphic design and the art and the gifts and the videos and and the website set up and everything like that that they had to do the framework that they needed to be able to set that up and execute that on a mass scale because it's, you know, they've got a worldwide audience. Um, that's the sort of thing a band that works nine to five doesn't have the time for. Mm, sure, sure. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, Tim, I don't know if you remember this, but the, I can't remember the name of the band, but they they staged a hunger strike outside Triple J said they weren't going to eat until Triple J played their record and, and, <laughs> and the Jays actually did play their record after a few days of them just refusing to leave. So there's an example of one working. <laughs> I can also give it an example. I tell this one in my lectures. My mate's in a band called Super Heist. They sent uh, the record company um, uh, some pizzas and uh, the CDs were attached to the pizza. So nice, warm, steaming pizzas for all the, uh, the A&R staff. But they didn't do their research and realize that the, uh, the people who were opening the CDs were all vegans and they sent them meat lovers. So they're definitely <laughs> both bad. So you've got to do your research if you do stuff oh, like this. Oh, no. Oh. Let's go back to your lecture now, Tim. Since I've uh, I've hijacked sure. it, um, you're talking about the, the hard work. So I'll leave this over to you, mate. Understanding yeah. the press release is just a part of the job. Yeah. So I mean, we've kind of gone over the email database stuff, and it takes a long time to actually get, first of all, numbers of people in there, then also establishing relationships with them, and that's, you know, I can ask an editor to put up an a, an article. Uh, as in, hey, can you do this today, please? This would be great. And even then I know the answer could possibly be no, but it takes a little while before you can actually work up the relationship where you can ask someone to do something rather than just send the press release um, and then follow up a couple of days later. Once you actually start to get that relationship of sending people good stuff, that's when they'll, you know, when they start to connect with you about the bands that you're sending them, that's when you can start to establish that relationship and find out exactly what type of stuff they like. And then once you know that you can ask directly because you go, look, I know you're going to like this one. Mm-hmm. Here it is. Would you mind getting behind it and supporting it? Yep. Absolutely. And exa- exactly what I said there. It's like, just cause you send it doesn't mean anyone will give a shit. <laughs> it's a bit like fishing. And, 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 my analogy. You, you bait the hook up and you stick it out there, but you don't really know you're going to get any nibbles. Do you? No, definitely not. And uh, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not even to do with what you've put out there. It's not even to do with the band. It's sometimes because 
oops, I forgot. Today was the day that Splendor in the Grass got announced and all media just drop everything and talk about nothing else except that on that yeah. day. Yeah. And that's it. You're cooked. Yep. Which goes back to doing your research and hopefully your, your, hopefully your publicist is aware of all those major milestones that are coming on the on the calendar. Correct, yeah. And another thing... And that's why it's... Sorry. Sorry, Tim. That's why it's good to have a publicist or at least another team member around who's, you know, watching that stuff. Mm. Whether that's a manager or, you know, an agent who goes, hey, whoa, don't, you know, I know that's coming because I've got a band on it or something like that, that, you know, can give you that heads up. Mm. And and that's or another thing, you know. When I was um, just be aware of everything going on. When I was sort of self managing my band, I was I was arrogant enough to think that I could do you know it all myself, and I didn't need a publicist. But the thing in hindsight, which I want to make aware to everybody listening or watching this, is that every time you're sitting down to write a press release, every time you're writing an email, every time you're going through all of these things that Tim's talking about, it's taking away from the time as well of you being a musician, you writing songs, you practicing your right. instrument, you doing all that stuff, and it's it, it's a lot of bloody work. So. Yeah, absolutely. You publicists are absolutely worth your money, in my opinion. Uh, and the other thing I want to I mean, touch on just quickly, yeah. Tim, before you go on, is that you talked about, again, that relationship, you being able to speak with these high-profile people, these editors, these producers, whoever it might be, who will take your call and yeah. hopefully listen to you. So this is an industry where, mm. you know, networks are incredibly important. Yeah, and it's not about kissing ass, man. And I think a lot of people, you know, who – you know, either they're you know, maybe they're not working with publicists or maybe they don't necessarily understand the relationships that are there. I, I think they there's there's sometimes there can be um, a perception out there that it's about like oh it's all about backslapping and it's all about kissing ass and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it's not. It's just about it's just about people, you know, connecting with other people who like similar types of music. And you know, sometimes I get things away at media outlets that you just go, wow, that is actually really huge. That's massive support for that band. And then there's other times where even it doesn't matter how much, you know, networking and whatever that I've done in the past, if the, the person doesn't like the act or whatever, there's no way I can talk them into a review. Hmm. It just, it's just not going to happen. And it's about knowing that you don't spit the dummy at that moment. It's just going, okay. I mean, even though I've got a client that I've got to report back to, I need to report that back to them that it either was poor timing or the editor didn't like it. And it's not that there's not going to be support there in the future. It's just about it's not here, but we'll find our successes elsewhere. So it's about persistence, really, and about knowing where to go if plan A doesn't work. Yep, yep. I think that's a very important word there, Tim, persistence. Let's move along in your lecture. By all means, go the DIY route. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what you were saying about um, when you said before before like, I, I was young and arrogant. And I, I don't think there's arrogance in knowing that or, or in going the DIY route. I think, one, there's an acknowledgement that publicity costs money yeah. um, just to even get me to start talking about you or talking about you to other people. Um, but it's also about if you are going to do it, get stuck in, you know, and it, it's not arrogant to think you can do it all yourself, but you do need to acknowledge that, it, like you said, it's going to take up your time playing as a musician and potentially even, you know, some sometimes musicians are also the manager in their band. They're also the booking agent. It's going to take you away from doing those things as well as take you away from playing in the band. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's, Yeah. Yeah, uh, and if you question. are sorry, yep. going into publicity, if you are going into publicity, um, either coming from being a manager or you know you're, you're coming straight in and wanting to be a publicist, it's not a job to get into just because you want a guaranteed wage. It 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 really is about you've got to love what you're doing and you've got to really want to be the champion for these bands. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very insightful, Tim. Thank you very, very much for sharing all this. It's great. Uh, Pat Greer has asked, um, as far as Facebook, hey, sorry, mate. Hey, Patty, how you doing? <laughs> oh, you know, Pat, good one. Pat wants to know, as far as Facebook and YouTube go, are you advertising and how much are you spending in terms of the budget and how long are the campaigns running for? Also, is there a figure you deem to be too much or potentially a waste of money? 
Uh, I think uh, I don't necessarily advertise on YouTube. I definitely advertise on Facebook and I, I do ask bands if they can spare the cash to put aside some budget to, to advertise there across Facebook and Instagram. Um, and I think that's a, that's a question of uh, really you need to be monitoring the results of any campaign that you do. Um, if it's not working, don't punch money into that same audience. Try different variants. Um, you know, try going really specific, try going really broad, um, making sure that you're targeting fans of bands that are very similar to yours, um, making sure that you, um, you know, are targeting the right age demographics. Um, and it's really a trial and error until you find something that's effective. You um, and and as, far as, as far as budgets go, it can be, you know, a, a, a well-placed $5 on a boosted post can be really effective. And if you're, and like, I would be spreading your spend out over multiple things on Facebook. So it might be a boosted post. It might be an, a, a, a specifically created ad. Um, but certainly don't be putting $500 into one thing. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean. I thought it was interesting you said uh, Instagram ads over, say, uh, Google or YouTube. Is that is that how you're approaching it with your campaigns? Uh, look, I think uh, that's just an experience thing. I, I haven't really ever bothered to go into Google and YouTube ads. Mm -hmm. um, but Facebook, you get Instagram ads just as a bonus of doing Facebook advertising. So that's just been where it's been most effective sure. um, for me. Um, but, you know, if, if you are using Google ads and all of that sort of stuff, um, then, you know, just use the same principles about, you know, trial and error and making sure your, you know, your target demographics are, are right. And, and that you're, you know, you're not just, you're not, you're not just like throwing stuff at the wall to see, what sticks you are being relatively educated about it and it's and it's about just tweaking it to see if it's more effective or not mm -hmm. okay cool here's where you're talking about your target audience tim obviously it's important to do yep. your research who you're sending your stuff to you're not wasting your time or their time or your money yeah yeah uh, and i mean i've i've learned that, look i'll be i'll be honest i've learned this by trial and error myself um you know some things i've had real success with and other things that i've gone you know i've had people come back to me going, don't ever send stuff to me ever again. <laughs> and that's just, Oh shit. Okay. My apologies. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it just comes down to doing your research, doesn't it? And, and just before you send that, yeah. that, that package out, uh, making sure that the person who's going to be receiving that is, is interested in what you're doing. And sometimes you, you won't know that until you actually start a conversation with them. Mm. It can look really, it can look very much like, you know, that person's going to be into your music. And, you know, they can come out going, this is hot trash. Don't ever send me anything ever again. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is, it, it is, you know, there's a few landmines out there you can step on, but it's, mm. it's, you know, generally you can tell. What do, you, what do you do, Tim, when someone approaches you and they say, here, Tim, here's my band, here's my money, and then you go, this is a pile of shit, no one's going to like it. What's the, uh, what's the immoral struggle there that you might or might not have? I, Try very hard uh, to say no before I know it's a pile of shit. Uh -huh. um, uh, so um, I have had a few situations where I've had uh, bands do a bait and switch almost where I've been sent demos and go, man, this is really good, but I've not been told that they're demos. And then I'm sent perhaps the final thing and it's had sort of all of the good things about that song stripped out by a poor recording or, you know, like the demo was better or, you know, or the thing that I liked about the song is now being stripped out by a producer or, mm -hmm. you know, I've had things like that happen. And, and more often than not, it's, you know, the thing that was cool about it is the thing that would have, which is why I wanted to work with it in the first place. Um, and, unfortunately sometimes it means that that you know we're committed to work on it and it and it doesn't work because the the thing is now not the package that i was sort of sold on 
Mm. So it's really important to be, you know, really important to be upfront about it um, and, you know, let let them know that it's demos and that it's just the start of the conversation. Um, I don't think, um, I mean, these days anyway, I mean, I've said yes to stuff in the past that have been demos um, early on in my career, but, you know, I, I probably wouldn't say no until I heard a master or, a, or at least, a, you know, pretty solid final mix now. Very good, mate. Very good. We better keep going. Number three, it's hard writing about my own band and other tales. Mm, I get that one a lot. Um, that that it's you know, I'll, I'll ask for a bio for a band because, I mean, if I'm starting with a band, you know, there's, I might be familiar with them. I might not. Um, you know, with the, their entire story, so you know, if I don't know the entire story, I kind of need you to tell me about it. And I don't necessarily need, you know, a creatively written bio to write a press release from, but at least some bullet points would be great. But, um, you know, I often get bands sending stuff over and it's, and they'll go, oh man, it's really hard writing about myself. Here's two sentences. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, oh, that's not, oh. so, you know, just acknowledge that, like, if you, if we are working together or if you're working with a publicist, that I don't need you to be a creative writer at that point. If we've already decided to work together, I actually just need the, the main points of the story so I can actually write about them. And, and my job is then to be the creative writer mm-hmm. and, and weave those bullet points into a narrative. Um, so, you know, just write everything down that you've done and I'll figure out what to include and what not to include. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to be a creative writer. If you are going the DIY route, what I've put there at the end is write, 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 write until you and your band are happy with what you've written about your band. Because I think the thing that most bands are tentative about with doing bios and doing press releases about themselves is they're worried that people are going to think that they're full of themselves and that they love themselves and, you know, no one wants to be working with an arrogant band. The thing is, is that most of the media you're writing to, half the time they won't even know that it's come directly from you. So write as though you're not in the band, Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yep. But I get it. It's hard to go to write about yourself without going, we're the best. We're absolutely the best. We want everything in the world because we're the best. <laughs> it, it, because it, you know, the, the want out of it is that you actually, you go, we're wanting to solicit reactions here. We want good reviews. We want, um, you know, articles written about us, all of that sort of stuff. So I guess the automatic uh, reaction is to go, is to, write about yourself as though you're the best band in the world. And it's not necessarily the case. It's about writing truthfully about where you are and what you're doing and celebrating your successes that you've had, the supports you've done. Maybe you've got awards that you've won. Um, You know, there's a way of doing that where it's factual, um, but still celebratory, if Mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Yeah, sure, sure. Look, I think the bio is very, very important. Um, I think it's a sales tool. I think that it's your professional yeah. introduction to the world. And I, I always say that a bio, if you haven't heard the music, should lead you, leave the reader with an understanding of what they're all about, what that artist is all about. So that's why I, I personally like artistic comparisons in the bios. I, don't, I would like to get your opinion on artistic comparisons, Tim, where you sort of say, you know, you're telling people who you're influenced by or you're saying what you're, uh, you sound like. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, I think it should probably be left out of the first sentence for sure, or possibly even the first paragraph. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly, creative ways of comparison, definitely. I think the uh, uh, the old uh, it sounds like Led Zeppelin uh, made a baby with <laughs> Arctic monkeys. You know, like. That, that stuff just doesn't work anymore. Like that's the, it, that's very cliche and it's very – people, media have seen that before. I think, you know, if you're going to compare a band to an, another band, do it just straight out. Don't, don't uh, you know, don't feel like you have to 
write half your bio about what that sounds like, you know. Mm-hmm. One of the, one of the best ones I always read was the that band Heaven the Axe who said uh, we sound like well they didn't say we sound like but they just said it's it's Slipknot beat meets Britney Spears and uh, for that video they did and. Uh, <laughs> You know, very, very intriguing when people hear that, and then when you watch the video, it's you know you you had um, you had that kind of vibe happening. So uh, go and check out Heaven the Axe if you want to uh, see that Slipknot <laughs> meets Britney Spears. But anyhow, we better move on, Tim. Um, sure. Make your life easier using the internet. Yeah, so I, I think we've kind of gone over this a little bit earlier. You know, Mailchimp is it's it, it's as it's as entry level and as as professional as you want to get it's you know for someone that's using uh you know a mailing list um a mailing list provider uh for the first time mailchimp is very it's very visual oriented it's easy to use it's not uh it's not too jargony um and and you can get straight into it Mm -hmm. um one thing that i can say is uh you, your mailing list is only as strong as your uh, your database or spreadsheet that you base it on. So the more data that you have about every outlet or every entry that you have in your spreadsheet, the better. Because then you can actually use, you can divide your list up along those field names. So, you know, if you're, if you have, genre as a field in there and you can go through and fill out what genre or you know i have you know for uh, primary and secondary genre um fields um you know if you have location address all of that stuff the more things that you have in there the more detailed every entry for your spreadsheet is the better you're going to be able to use mailchimp and the better you're going to be able to individualize every mail out that you send Mm -hmm. and i've learned this over time from just shotgunning stuff out to everyone and having a a terrible open rate um, and a terrible click rate down to being very specific about who i send it to and i won't say it's an amazing open rate and amazing click rate because i don't think there's a publicist in the world that would would boast that Um, but certainly way better and far far better interaction Mm -hmm. um, by being very specific and having a very clean and very good spreadsheet and database that is the the foundation of what you're doing whether it's mailchimp or whether it's um you know your mailing list provider or, or whatever it is that you're using but then you know it gets also gets back to that ease of access so using things like dropbox and google drive that are one click here's the files like that stuff is very important um, to be able to just get it easily and be able to do whatever it is that you're asking that person to do with it. Mm-hmm. It's so important. Absolutely. Totally agree. And again, thanks for sharing. Be strategic around your timing. So you've kind of touched on this, but uh, just go through this one for us, Tim. Yep. Um, it it kind of goes back to, you know, if it's considered out now, the, the, the chances of things like reviews or even anyone posting any news about it, they drop virtually to nil. So, you know, even though it kind of kind of sucks that you, you're not going to get, uh, un- unless your, you know, your EP or album or whatever it is drops really hard and it charts and, and things happen out of your chart uh, release, then, you know, you've got to make sure that there's things that come directly after you release. So like a tour or something like that, you can actually prolong the, the reasons for people uh, wanting to do things with your music. Mm-hmm. That's the, you know, and then it's releasing singles and doing another tour in, you know, three, four months. Mm-hmm. And that's the way that you prolong the album cycle and you actually keep content getting out there, but you're not going to get reviews for your album or your EP or whatever it is very far past release at all. Um, What do you think about the strategy of releasing multiple singles first? You know, like releasing it, I learned this from a guy who's doing it in the uh, the EDM scene where, you know, you release release a single and try and get maybe three weeks out of that and then bang, another single and bang, another single and then the album once they're all out. 
Yeah. Um, Australia, I mean, for radio in Australia, you're definitely getting less singles out of an album than you would if you were, say, in the UK or, or the US. Um, if you look at um, the rollout for albums um, in the UK or US or, or Europe, you know, you might actually get four or five singles out before the album drops um, because they like radio over there will, will add, you know, stuff weekly. Um, whereas here it's about focusing on one song for a couple of weeks and making sure that everyone's across it. And, you know, so you may only get, I mean, if your album rollouts, you know, three, four months, then, you know, you might get three singles out before the album drops um, but I, I wouldn't go any more than that. Um, and, and, you know, you might, you might tour one or two of those singles before the album and then do an album tour as well. Um, if you've got enough time in between each of those, but you know, by that stage, if you're, if you're dropping two singles, touring them, and then dropping the third single within an album announce and a tour, then, you know, that's easily six months or more. So, you know, you've got to think about your spend with a publicist over six months then rather than, you know, a focused two to three months. Mm. Tim, here's a question we haven't asked, uh, and I'm sure people are interested. What's it going to cost them, mate? Uh, what's an indie band who's coming to you uh, to release their new record? Um, what's it going to cost them? Can you give them a ballpark? I know how long's a piece of string, but... Yeah, I'm I'm hesitant to give a, a hard and fast rate because uh, it, it's you know my rate is different to Chris Marricks, it was different to Death Proof, is different to John Howard, yeah. is different to Mucho Bravado, is different to you know what I mean. Like mm-hmm. it's it's really different across the board. So I'm I'm hesitant to to say that, but it's anywhere between five hundred bucks a month and twenty five hundred bucks a month. I tell you um, what, then. how about this, Tim? How about you give us your email address? <laughs> it's tim at collisioncourse.com.au. I'm going to send this out to everyone. Sure. Um, and then they can ask you, right? We can go into negotiations. Tim at collisioncourse.com.au. Just sent that to everybody who's on the webinar. Yeah, no, that was a good one, buddy. Well well reflected. Um, be strategic around your timing again. You're talking about yep. premieres? Yep. So... The, the point of those premieres is giving that outlet, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a general media outlet like the music, whether it's a heavy music outlet. Um, the, the point of doing that is that you're actually giving it, ex- giving that outlet exclusivity for that uh, period of time. Generally, that's 24 hours. Um, so that means that when you share the content, you're sharing their link and not your direct YouTube link. Um, the, the point, the point of it is, is that you're, you're getting to access their audience and they're getting to access your audience for that deemed period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's about respecting that and making, and that's the sort of stuff that really, uh, helps build your story with media. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably, I've had this conversation a few times with bands about, um, about whether doing premieres is worthwhile. And sometimes I've worked with bands where, um, yes, their native reach on their Facebook might actually be the same or if not more than uh, partnering with a media outlet to do a premiere. But sometimes it's actually about more than just the actual reach. I mean, granted, you don't want to have something that's going to be absolutely terrible reach, but it's about furthering the story with that media outlet and if they feel ownership over something if something goes really well and if they go well we we really helped that band in the you know do that premiere and it went really well you know things like it it then becomes you know far easier to be able to talk about doing uh interviews or feature articles or having them feature you in their spotify playlist Mm -hmm. or um you know or you know recommending you uh, for festivals when people, you know, when festival bookers ask all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, there's, there's more to it than just getting access to reach. It's also about building your story with that media outlet. Mm -hmm. 
that makes sense. That makes absolute sense. No, cool. Um, number six, understand that you may not be at the top of the priority list. Yeah, and I mean, that that's possibly a bitter pill to swallow sometimes. And I mean, I, I also have to understand that as well. So when I go to somewhere with a premiere or if I... If I'm asking some uh, an outlet for a review or I'm asking for anything, good chance that there's actually hundreds of other, I mean, in my office alone, there are seven of us pitching things every day. Mm-hmm. So there's just seven people with multiple campaigns in our office, let alone the hundreds of other offices around the country, including labels who are pitching things to media every single day. Mm. So, you know, the the thing that bands sometimes don't understand is that they don't necessarily understand how to take a no. Mm -hmm. And and like I've put in the, the slide there, it's not that they consider you a small artist. It's just sometimes there's actually just 200 things in their inbox that day and they might not have even got to the email yet. Mm. Um, and you know, some, sometimes it's, they would love to help, but like I said before, you know, something else might've happened that day, massive tour might've got announced and they had to, they had to, you know, they, you got to understand that they also compete with other media outlets for clicks and for views. Yep. So they also need to consider that they, they need to post that news as well in order to at least be looked at it's it's a it's a really brutal industry really when you when you break it all down isn't it it's yeah. it's, it's absolutely horrible for some people because you're putting your heart and your soul into this art and then quite often the the brutal reality is that people just don't give a shit what you've done because it, you're just another band you're just another artist hmm. and i mean the, you know that's why i guess you know no no outlet is too small for you to share and and you know celebrate when you do get those announces all those premieres no matter where it's at and and just really celebrate it man and mm. and you know you support them because they're also going to want to be on the up and coming as well and you know it it may not be the you know the expectation you had and i mean i i mean I, i'm always you know looking to meet the expectation of the bands but sometimes these things just don't come off you know mm, mm. And it goes back to what I said, I think, Tim, before you even get to a publicist, before you even speak to someone like Tim, you should be, you know, writing the best songs you possibly can, recording them in the best capacity that you possibly can, making the best, you know, album that you possibly can, if it's going to be an album or an EP or whatever your product or service is, and then going and doing those other things, like getting your image right, getting your artwork right, getting your bio right, your, your press kit right, all that stuff, in, a, in a, and giving yourself the best chance of trying to pinprick this incredibly difficult uh, noise wall that you're trying to break through and you know and like tim said celebrate those little wins and uh don't expect this to happen overnight it's it's a game for long stays for most people you know overnight success in this in this industry is is not impossible but it's it's rare hmm. and look i i totally understand where bands are coming from as well like with the publicity spend it's it's actually hard to see what you would claim as return on on investment mm-hmm because even even if I get all of the things, it doesn't necessarily, you know, even if I get Triple J, even if I get, um, you know, all of the media outlets that you'd want, even if I get all the reviews, um, that's awesome. But it, it's hard to tell, like, if you do well with sales in, in your first week of album releases, it's hard to tell what, you know, those those things that I got for you resulted in those sales or where, I mean, apart from actually having tracking links that you go, all right, we made this many sales out of, out of that. Mm. Um, you know, it's hard to actually get the data on, would we have made these sales anyway? Yep. So it's, you know, so I, I get it when, when bands maybe question, oh, did we get our value for money out of a publicity spend? Mm. But the thing is, if you don't, do publicity and you don't necessarily get any hits or you don't make many sales. Um, it's hard to then put the genie back in the bottle and run publicity to try and push something that's already out. 
You mm. can't. And that's, you know what I mean? So once yep. you've once you've cooked it, you kind of can't uncook it. <laughs> and you know, that's the big takeaway that I got from speaking with you, from speaking with Angela yesterday, from speaking with Stephen Green. Uh, all the publicists are saying the same. So you either got to have a go and do it yourself and commit to it, or approach that publicist and uh, and do it before you actually let the genie out of the bottle, like you said. Correct. Mm. Writing and designing the press kit. Now, again, uh, you're very good at this, and I, I've learned that you do it in uh, <laughs> a little bit of graphic design. You're doing it in uh, Mailchimp, but yep, go on, Tim. Tell us about this, mate. So, I guess the main thing that you want to uh, do with your press release is actually get to the point really quickly. In your first paragraph, your first paragraph should literally be about what this press release is about. Band is releasing song A and will be available in Spotify and iTunes this Friday and album is out May 19th, whatever whatever date it is. And, you know, yes, it's about being descriptive and creative with that when you say it, but the first paragraph should actually say, this is exactly what's happening around this band. And then you can get into, you know, that you can dig deeper on, um, you know, the influences of the band and, you know, the, the facts around who recorded the music and who made the video clip and, you know, a quote from the band about, you know, how excited you are about the record coming out and all of that sort of stuff. But just that acknowledgement that don't fluff around with, you know, in the first paragraph about, you know, describing band, you know, and, and you know, does it, you know, it sounds like this mixed with that or whatever. It's it's about, it's a call out to go, this is what's happening and this is what we want you to talk about. And if people get, you know, if people dig the music, then they can dig further on on uh, on everything else that's in the further paragraphs. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's just really important to get to the point because like, like I said, media don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time. They want to just know, here's what's happening. And here's the time frame it's happening in. And, you know, people, and then you can plan accordingly around that. Awesome, Tim. Thanks, Modi. Uh, next slide. Do tell the media outlets exactly what's going on. This is, is that pretty much what you're yep, just talking that's about. Exactly what's on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. For some reason or other, journos love alliteration. So if you can, if you can uh, write a headline that has, you know, something, you know, words that start with the same letter as your band name or something like that. For some reason or other, they love that. Mm. And here's one good thing I'd like to add is that if you do, if you do have the ability to write a really good press release, and again, I always say that, you know, you are what you repeatedly do. So if you just write and write and write, like Tim said, then you are going to get better yes. at that. But one of the things I love about when you send out a press release is often that, uh, the journalist or the the blogger or whoever you've sent it to, they they often just copy it and paste it, and you're reading your own words about yourself, aren't you? It's kind of funny that you're saying how great you are and how yeah, good this record is. There's a bit of that, definitely. So I mean, you know, you got to prepare for that, and and so if you if your press release is written well, then you know you're going to look great elsewhere. But I mean, and you know, I'm not. This isn't uh, discouraging outlets from doing that. You know some of that stuff is it, it's news. So it's to be, mm. it's to be shared and, you know, that stuff. But uh, I mean, you know, shout outs to those, those uh, media outlets that, uh, you know, take their own tack on it. And sometimes even, you know, we'll, we'll uh, include like short single reviews as, as a paragraph in their write up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that stuff's always really helpful when I can include a quote later on um, in, in press releases in the future. Um, I don't always get quotes about singles, so that that stuff's really helpful. Um, but yes, yeah, so, you know, some some outlets definitely go the extra mile, and you know that that's uh, that's really appreciated as well. Mm. And and when you're writing your press release, guys, write in the in the uh, the third person, so you're not saying I'm so great, but yeah. you talk about someone like even though you're writing it, you're writing it like somebody else is saying it about you, so they can copy and paste it without right. you sounding incredibly arrogant. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> And then the follow-up, Tim, really important. So talk talk to us through this a little bit, mate. Yeah, I mean, so the following up is where you can actually really start to build those relationships, mm -hmm. and also, and I, for want of a better word, better word, uh, take advantage of those relationships. So um, 
you know, that's, it's about, uh, you know, being personal in your follow up as well. So, you know, if there's something that that person uh, it, it, that you know that they're into, say, say they've mentioned that they're going to see Logan on the weekend or, you know, that they're going to uh, like a record fair or something on the weekend, you know, when you follow up with them about, uh, you know, another thing the week after, it's about, hey, how'd you go with your crate dig? Did you find any great vinyl? You know, or it's, um, what do you think of Logan? I, I saw it and, it, you know, I thought it was really kick ass, you know. So um, one thing that I've um, started doing with my follow-ups is I share a little bit about myself as well. So, yep. um, you know, I talk about what I did on my weekend. You know, I do all my radio follow-ups on Mondays so that I can, you know, get my week really kicked off well. So if there's radio stuff that my artists are going to get, that, you know, at the start of the week, I remind them that here's what I've got going on this week. Um, hope you like some of these tracks. Um, but, you know, I really kick it off with what I did on my weekend. Like my car died the other week. So I was like, <laughs> uh, I got the, you know, the transmission blues, my, my transmission in my Falcon blew up. And I got so many, uh, you know, so many people saying, you know, oh man, Falcons suck or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, so and that engagement, yeah. opens up so many more conversations than just hey do you like these songs can you can you play them mm, sure sure and and also saying thank you is massive a lot of people you know forget oh. about manners these days don't they oh my god i even if my reply to something is thank you uh, that's all i do yeah um uh, it, it's and more often than not the thank yous come back to you <laughs> um you know because the thing is is like when those when those outlets post something for you or they do a write up or a review or coverage about something, inevitably they're the ones that are going to be putting their hand up to go and review stuff live and, you know, or, or go and, you know, shoot, uh, you know, photographers go and shoot uh, shows and that sort of stuff. And sometimes you get to send people the, the thing that I love. One of the things that I love about my job is I get to send journos along to shows uh, that possibly could end up being their favorite show of all time. And I, you know, and I've experienced this in the last couple of weeks because I've been doing media lists for Alter Bridge and I Prevail and just people coming away from that saying that thank you so much. That was one of the best shows I've ever been to in my life. And, you know, more than anything, that's almost more, more uh, rewarding than the cash, to be honest. Because mm. some of those, some of those people are just like, I'm going to be forever in your debt and, and you just go like, it's, uh, it's all right. It's just me putting your name on the door, you know. And but you just don't know the uh, you just don't know the uh, the value that you're actually. I mean, yeah, it's not cash value sometimes, but you know, it's you're saving them money and you're giving them experiences, and that stuff just comes back in spades, man. Absolutely, absolutely, Tim. Hey, um, Claudia wants to know: uh, Do you have any good templates, Tim, for a good press release? Like I said, yours is a cracker. Do you would you be prepared to share that with anyone? Or sh I mean, people can see it and, and reverse engineer it anyway. Whenever you send one out, but it is a very yeah. good. Yeah, um, I think it's probably one thing that's worked um, for me is uh, d d don't put the the photo above the headline because chances are if you're scrolling down and see a photo and you have no idea who the band is. That's not a good start. Mm. So definitely put the name of the band and the headline first and photo second. And then what's been working really well is I'll put the first two or three paragraphs um, in a block uh, and then put the, whatever content it is. So like the video or um, the the song stream or whatever it is directly after that. So the first three paragraphs, if, if you read nothing else, you've got everything. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean. And sure. then I put I put the content and then the downloads all it's kind of in the guts of the press release and then the remainder of the text underneath all of that stuff. Um, because yeah, all that stuff's good stuff, but you're getting to the content that you really want people to sink their teeth into straight away. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's, I mean, I'm 
not really going to send out, I'm not going to send people my template, but <laughs> if you go into MailChimp, it's really, it, it's literally a drag and drop builder. It's, yeah. you don't even have to know HTML. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. It's, you just, you, you know, I've got my banner at the top that says for, for immediate release and my logo. And then I just get stuck into headline photo, essential information content. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the professor later, it's uh, it's really effective. It the is. clicks that you need to have are right there at the top. Yep, you've got the SoundCloud embeds and stuff like that, which is really good. Yeah, and so it, it comes down to just mm-hmm. saying everything you need to say in that first couple of paragraphs, and then get them clicking. Yeah, that's just that's my big advice. Yeah, I would say to everybody who's listening to this is to uh, get yourself on Tim Price's uh, email list and then you can have a look at these <laughs> fantastic press releases that are coming through and like I said, reverse engineer them because it's really good. And then of course, Tim, there's the one percenters. I sent Tim Price a press release the other day, said, check out this, what do you think? And you know what he wrote back to me and said? He said, yeah, you, you might want to spell press release right. <laughs> so you've got to get to it. <laughs> and, you know, and that stuff really is important. And, you know, no excuses because there are no excuses. But, again, um, you know, you're trying to do this really quickly. You're copying and pasting and you're doing a million other things. It doesn't matter. So, luckily, um, getting someone to proofread your press release is really important too. Totally. So, Tim, totally. thanks for that. No, Unfortunately, please, for me, please excuse me, mate. I'm, I'm, a spelling, I'm a spelling Nazi, dude. That's I'm sorry good. about that. You should be. You should be. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Putting on top of your follow-ups, have we covered everything here, Tim? I uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, phone calls. Now, this is an interesting one because um, yep. I actually teach my students that, and I tell my students that phone calls are really good to me. I always say that I'll send through the press release, and then I'll 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 back it up with a call. And you're saying not to do that. So this is interesting. I'd like to hear your your contrary opinion. It kind of depends on timing, dude. Yep. So if you're sending that and calling them five minutes after you sent it to see if they got it, mm-hmm. yeah, of course they did. Yep. They just haven't got to it yet. And yep. you've just annoyed them in their day. <laughs> so a phone call like a phone call should be used if it's you know, if it's actually time what am I trying to say here? So if you if it's very so, say for instance, you've lined up a premiere, and the outlet said, "Okay, it's going to drop at midday," and it's twelve thirty, and you're going, and you've sent an email going, "Ah, where is it, guys? We're like our audience is asking for it. Where, where is it?" Mm-hmm. And they haven't responded to that, then go for a phone call. But if it's just a, if it's just an immediate follow up on a phone call. It, it, it's a it's a good way to to, to just really annoy someone. Yep. If you're following up on something a day or two later, or even later that afternoon, perhaps, yeah, that would be fine. Mm-hmm. It, some look, partially, I guess partially this this one here is to do with my preference. Is I I don't like calling people about stuff. I'll email over a call any day, um, and I prefer the same back. But it's uh, it's. It's personal preference. If phone calls are your thing, and like for instance, there's a guy in my in my office, Josh. He he way prefers phone calls, and it's effective for him. So I really think it's a personal preference. But knowing how busy media outlets are and how busy industry people are, two things are in the um, uh, in the positive column for for emails is one, you can get to them when you've got the time. And two, it it doesn't take it doesn't interrupt the day. Sure, sure. No, look, uh, that's to- all totally valid, and I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you, and I think it's great having, you know, someone like yourself with, who's at the coalface doing this day in day out, come in and give these opinions. Because, like I said, everyone's got different opinions. Um, mm. I like the phone call because I think you can be a little bit more personable and, and as long as you're not, you know, disrupting them, like you, like I said, if you can, again, do your research and if you're approaching, an, uh, for instance, a, an editor of a publication, you want to make sure that they're not on deadline and they're trying to get their publication out or, right. um, but Look, there's you know, definitely pros to a phone call as well. It's definitely harder to say no to a phone call. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes um, for me, but again, it just helps maybe yeah. in my mind that you stand out a little bit more. If you're very polite, you're very courteous, uh, you're very thankful. And then when they get to your press release, you go, oh, you they... Sorry, what was that? 
it depends how much you call that in too. If you're calling every day, that's <laughs> yeah, also no. going to be like, it's no. it's all right, mate. I get it. You've got press releases coming in. <laughs> I'll put it up. You know, like, so it can, you know, it's about when knowing when to call that stuff in. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, we better move along, Tim, because we're going to be running out of time. So let's get to this review. The good, the bad, and the ugly. How did it go? Yeah, so I mean, with anything, you know, I guess I wrote this from a, like if you were doing it on a DIY basis, yep. you, you need to ask the question on how did it go? And I mean, I guess you could ask yourself this as well if you do it with a publicist because you do need to ask how did it go? Was our money well spent? Um, but it, from a DIY perspective is... Like, how would you do it better next time? Is it, is it um, you know, what did you miss? Mm -hmm. What did you get? How do you keep that relationship there with the things that you did get? Um, is it next time hire a publicist? Because honestly, if you've done DIY publicity and you've already built some of those relationships, taking the step of going into a publicist, you can only build. So, you know, those, it is, it is about, you know, reviewing it and seeing how you went. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the interesting thing about it is even though DI, you know, doing it yourself publicity is let, let's put in air quotes free. Um, what did it actually cost you? And it gets back to what you're saying about taking away from being a muso or being the, the, um, you know, in band manager. Um, what did it cost in your time? Mm. Did you have to buy advertising still? Did you, you know, did, did it take you away from being in the band? Are you now stretching relationships within your band because you're focusing more on that than actually being at the rehearsal room? Mm. You know, it. so you've got to look at what, you know, even though it's free, how much did it cost you? Mm. And that, that's a really, really good bunch of points you raised there, Tim. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, look, mate, that was a really killer conversation and a great lecture. And again, mate, I really want to thank you for your time because I know how bloody busy you are. I've got my Facebook, my absolute pleasure. Man. I've got my Facebook live happening and this happening. I don't even know the time, mate. Can you tell me what time it is? Uh, it is now. It's eleven thirty. We've nailed it. It's eleven thirty. Uh, nailed it. Did you want to nick off, or would you be up for taking a couple of questions if there are any? Or I'll take a couple of questions for sure. Yeah. Let's see if we can take some live questions from the audience. Um, does anyone want to ask Tim a question via the internet? Or is everybody too scared? Come on, I know some of you do. Yep, Nat Rowe, you've got your hand up. Let's see if it works for Nat. G'day, Nat. Have you got your mic on there, buddy? See, this is where... Hello? No, it's not happening for Nat. Um, there's a couple in the text box anyway. Uh, let's see. Lots of thanks coming in for you, Tim. Uh, Simon wants to know, Tim, is inboxing people, um, mm -hmm. is that a good approach or is it just annoying? Inboxing, so who? When you're inboxing Fans? people, followers yeah. personally to check out your band. Uh, hey, Tim, here's yeah. my band, dude. What do you reckon? Sorry? Like, you know, if I sent you an email, here's my band, Tim. Check it out. What do you think? If we don't have I'd probably a prefer an email over an inbox. Yep. Okay. You think um, you think email is still more professional than uh, um, <clears throat> in the Facebook inbox? Uh, look, it, if that's your first point of contact with me, drop me a, a message and say, hey, can I get your email address? I'd like to get a chat started. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yep. But dropping me links and and you know massive chat messages to get the conversation started i think is probably a misstep mm -hmm. vanessa wants to know what do you think about connecting the media through social media uh that it depends what it is i mean Twitter. there's i've seen in the last couple of days um there was a guy from the band tabra uh connected with jetstar uh, connected with music feeds about their experience with Jetstar. Um, and, you know, that's come off. But, you know, I think it's more I'd be connecting with with uh, media via their email inbox than anything. Mm -hmm. 
there's lots here, Tim, but I think uh, we might have to wrap it up because we both have to go. So, again, I want to thank everybody for, for showing up. Really appreciate you giving us your time, Tim. Thank you so much, mate, for uh, giving us your time and providing us with all these gold nuggets. If I was anyone listening to this, like I said, my best advice to go is get on your mailing list and to watch you in action because uh, you're very, very good and it's a very uh, – uh, you know, even though some of the stuff you send me, I'm not interested in. I like I like the presentation. I like seeing what it is and how you present. So, very very good. And um, yeah, have you got any parting pieces of wisdom for people, Tim? Before we wrap it up, um, just keep at it. Just persevere. It's mm-hmm. um, it's definitely a uh, Claudia on Facebook wants to know how do I get an internship. Um, so I don't do internships. I don't do anything that's unpaid. <laughs> there you go, Claudia. Go listen to my interview with uh, Stephen Green, his boss, and you might change your mind. All right. So, uh, did you listen to my interview with Greeny? I have. Yes, there's some very good information in there. That's all I'll say, Claudia. All right, Tim, thanks again for your time, mate. I look forward to seeing you, and it's definitely my shout the next time we catch up, buddy. No worries, man. All right. All the best. And I'll uh, I'll post this everywhere and I'll send everyone the links. Thanks again, everyone. I've got a great lecture coming up tonight for anyone who wants to be a concert promoter. I've got Brad Wesson from Soundworks Touring. And I'm going to be doing my best to squeeze out every little bit of knowledge he's got if you've ever wanted to uh, bring a band to your town or to your country. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's on at 8 o'clock tonight. You can check out at musicbusinessfacts.com forward slash summit. Thanks again, Tim. Thanks, everyone. I hope, a good, hope you all have a good day and I'll talk soon.